In the last video, we talked about the five amazing properties of water, which come from the fact that water is very polar and have those hydrogen bonds, which allow water to be less dense as a solid, have a high specific heat, high heat vaporization, cohesion, and adhesion. Now, on this video, we're going to talk about a little more about applications of these five properties to life. Now, one of the most important applications of this concept is the idea of capillary action. Now, capillary action is what happens when water crawls up tiny little tubes. You put a little uh, paper towel inside of, of, of a vial full of water, and the water will crawl up the paper towel all the way to the top. We're going to do that in class so you can see what I'm talking about. And the same thing you see over here. You put water inside of tubes, and the smaller the tube is, the more water will crawl up to the top. What's happening there? The smaller tube will allow more interaction, a greater surface area for interaction between the water molecules and the size of the tube. On the thicker tube, uh, you're going to have less interaction between water molecules and the sides. Some water molecules won't touch the sides. But since the tiny little tube, um, a lot more water molecules will touch the sides, that will allow the water molecule to stick to the sides. Meanwhile, other water molecules are sticking to themselves. And this will help the water molecules to be pushed up inside the tube all the way to the top. And if you have a microscopically small tube, theoretically, the water will go all the way to the top and, go, and actually, actually go out. And that's what's happening inside of the paper towel. And it's also what's happening inside the plants. Plants have roots. And inside the roots, the water is absorbed from the roots. And why? Because there's more water usually, typically, hopefully, you know, for the plant to survive. There's going to be a lot more water outside than inside the plant. So the water will flow by osmosis into the plant. Now, once the roots become rich in water, they will start going inside the stems. Now, inside the stems, you see these little tiny little holes. You see down the top right over there. Tiny little holes. And remember, if you make the holes really tiny, you maximize the surface for the water molecules to attach themselves by adhesion to the side of the, of the stem. Now, what's going to happen is what you see in the middle over here. Each water molecule will, will be attracted to the side, and then each water molecule will attract it to itself. So they will form this little train that will start crawling up towards the leaves. Now because on the bottom over here, the leaves are going to be drier than the roots, the roots are going to be wetter, you have a greater water potential on the bottom than you have on the top. The leaves open up on the bottom of them a little hole in the leaves that's called the stomata, which allows the water to leave from the leaves. So the leaves are constantly losing water. Now when that happens, it dries out the leaf. And then as the leaf becomes dries, drier, that creates a negative water potential, and the roots have more water than the leaves do. So because of simple diffusion, water will tend to move from when there's a lot of water to where there's less water. You will see this in class two to, with the paper towel lab we're going to do. Now, then, that, that little negative pressure, that little suckage that's going to happen because there's a greater water potential on the roots than in the leaves, and you add to that the fact that there's adhesion and cohesion to the sides of the stems, capillary action will do the rest and it will take the water all the way to the leaves, no matter how tall the plants are. Now, typically, the taller the plant is, the smaller, the more microscopic those little tubes have to be. And the real, real tall plants, they have even another really cool thing inside their stems, like the stems are not straight up like that. Instead of being straight up like that, they have these little catches. It's like this. I'm going to show you in a second. All right? So they have these little catches, like that. So what these things will do is that the water will pool over here instead of going all the way down and sinking below. So that prevents the water from going back down after already crawling all the way up. So that helps capillary action along even more. And, and so all of these little adaptations will allow water to go all the way up, even on a sequoia tree, which is hundreds of feet tall. And life would be impossible on land if it wasn't for this. Because remember, the higher you get, the quicker you get to the sunlight and you outcompete plants that cannot have these systems. So this is fundamental for life. Another one of these cool applications is the fact that water acts as a universal solvent. Now what that means is that water dissolves stuff. You put stuff in water, you put some sugar in water, you, you swirl around, the sugar seems to disappear. It didn't really disappear. What happened is that the little water molecules will surround the sugar molecules and completely mask or hide it. It's camouflage of sorts. You know, it's like, you know, a cloaking device. 
the little sugar disappears in the middle of the water molecules because it gets surrounded by it. Now, this happens because water is very adhesive. Water is magnetic. So the positive end of the water molecule, which is the hydrogen end, is attracted to anything negative that's put inside of it. And the negative end, which is the oxygen end, is attracted to anything positive that's, that's put inside of it. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about solutions later in the lecture series. But remember, this has something to do with the adhesive properties of water. And that's why when you put salt in the, in the, in the water, it would actually, water will actually bake the salt apart into the negative and positive ions and then surround them, like you see happening there on the right side. And I have a videos of this on the videos and lab, in what, web tutorials in my, in my uh, lecture series as well. Now, because of this, life will take advantage of the property that water dissolves stuff, and it will use water to move things around life. Sponges, for example, rely on the movement of water to bring nutrients to itself. It's a filter feeder, as I would call it. Likewise, it's the movement of water within the actual uh, sea star that moves the nutrients around and actually even helps the, the sea star move. The starfish actually moves because of the water that's moving through it. And you and I all have circulatory systems, which rely on the movement of blood, which is basically a solution full of water, mm -hmm. to actually move the nutrients around the body. So this is also showing that the, the fact that water is a universal solvent allows the life to take advantage of that to move things uh, around their uh, organisms. Likewise, sex reproduction is only possible because of water. It's in water that the sex cells, the egg and the sperm, find each other. And it's in water that the first birth will move around. Think about it. Even on us, you have flagellum in the sperm because inside the, the, the female, the sperm is going to swim through liquid in between the cells to try to find that egg that, that at the end of this journey. So all life begins with a swim when it comes to sexual reproduction. And, so, and it's even because of water that multicellular life evolved. Because in an aquatic environment, it's more advantageous to form connections to other cells and to form groups so that you have a greater uh, protection. So the first multicellular life, like this Volvox that you see on the left side, formed in water to protect itself from other things swimming in the water. So water is fundamental for life because it's also going to help out moving things and for sex and even the evolution of multicellular life. Water is also fundamental for life for a completely different reason. Water is part of the photosynthesis reaction. So as soon as photosynthesis is evolved, it relies on water. Look at that. It's, you get carbon from the atmosphere or from carbon that's dissolved in the water if you're an aquatic organism. And then you combine that with water to make sugar and oxygen, which are the things that other life forms are going to need to do cell respiration, which is the opposite. Now, when cell respiration happens, you produce water. So water is part of both cell respiration and photosynthesis. And in the case of photosynthesis, it's fundamental. It's in fact from water that you get the oxygen. It's not really from the carbon dioxide. Both the oxygen and the carbon from this carbon dioxide are going to end up in the sugar. The oxygen that you breathe comes from the breakdown of water. So water is fundamental for life because it's part of photosynthesis reaction. You wouldn't do it without it. And you wouldn't even have oxygen in the atmosphere, free oxygen, if it wasn't from the oxygen that's in the water. So again, this is important and why you need water for life. Another thing that's important is what we call hydrophobic interactions. This is interesting. Even the stuff that water does not dissolve, water does something to. Because see, only polar things, things that have a charge or things which have you know, areas which are more polar than others, like the water molecule itself, will dissolve in water. Things which are not polar, like oils and things like that, will actually separate from water. So they will not mix with the water. But that's actually important also. Because if you don't dissolve in water, water repels you. That means you hate water. You're going to avoid water with a, with a vengeance. This means things that are not polar will avoid water and attract each other instead. Now, that's very important for a lot of reasons. For example, in the origin of life, uh, you have these fats uh, which formed, you know, without the help of life in the primordial soup, the first you know, oceans of the world and all that stuff. But those fats would never have gotten together to form bigger bubbles, which were necessary to protect the early molecules of life 
if you didn't have the fat, that water repels the bubbles. It repels the fat, forcing the bubbles to stick together. If you put oil and water and mix it up, you're going to form all these tiny little bubbles. But if you just leave it alone, after a little bit, all the bubbles will form one large bubble. So spontaneous polymerization of lipids, of fats inside of water are fundamental to the formation of early life forms like you see on the left side over there. This means that that is what allowed life to actually evolve. So if it wasn't for the fact that water repels things that doesn't dissolve in it, you would never have life in the first place. You would never have those microspheres which were necessary for the first protobionts to evolve. Likewise, it is because of hydrophobic interactions which the, the, the cell membrane stays in shape. You see the tails of the phospholipids, which are the things that make up the cell membrane, which we'll learn about when we talk about biochemistry and the cell membrane. These chains of the lipids, or the tails of them, you see over here, hate water. They're hydrophobic. But the heads, the top part of, the, of, of this molecule, loves water. It's hydrophilic. This means that the heads will try to touch the water, both inside and outside of the cell. Meanwhile, the tails will try to avoid water and instead attract each other. That in itself is what maintains the structure of the cell membrane. And then the surface tension of water pushing from both sides will help maintain the membrane integrity. So water itself is also going to be responsible for maintaining cell membranes. And without cell membranes, you don't have a cell because cell membranes are a fundamental characteristic of all cells. So this means very early on in the origin of life, this will be fundamental for life. Now, there's even one more reason why water is important. Proteins are the things that make you what, who you are and the things that do things in your body. They are the things that do all the functions of your body. Now, the functions that proteins perform depends on the shape of those proteins. Now, the shape of those proteins depends on the way they fold. Now, the way they fold also depends on water because areas of the protein which are polar or that have a charge are going to be attracted by water and they're going to face the water. But areas of the protein which are hydrophobic or hate the water are going to avoid the water and instead are going to be attracting each other. This means that if you have a protein, like for example, look at this cable that I have over here. If you have a protein and this little area of the protein hates water, it's going to fold to avoid the water that's around the outside, meaning that this is going to cause the protein to fold. So the folds that proteins have also depend on the structure on water. And there you go. Hydrophobic interactions and hydrophilic interactions. Hydrophobic means to hate water. Hydro, water, phobic, fear. Philic means to love. Hydrophilic means to love water. Hydrophobic means to hate water. Both of those things together are going to help water maintain life the way you see it today. So water is fundamental for life. Hope you learn a lot. On the next video, we're going to talk about mixtures and the role the water takes in those things.